These students, the next lecture is about the uh, gross anatomy of the larynx and the vocalization. Uh, first, I'd like to describe the different parts of the pharynx uh, before I introduce the uh, laryngeal structures. As you see here, this is a mid-sagittal section of the head and neck, and this one is a posterior aspect. Uh, in both, you see the three parts of the pharynx. The uppermost, labeled with uh, yellow, is called the nasopharynx. This communicates through the coana with the uh, common nasal cavity. The next one is the oropharynx. Uh, this is also called oral part of the pharynx. This communicates with the oral cavity through the oropharyngeal isthmus. And the third one, labeled with green, is the larmous part of the uh, uh, pharynx. This is the laryngopharynx, or laryngeal part of the pharynx. This, is, uh, include, uh, includes the, uh, this includes the laryngeal inlet. For my posterior view, you see the same. The, uh, nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the uh, laryngopharynx. In the cl clinical practice, we may use other terms for these three, the epipharynx, the mesopharynx, and hypopharynx, according to the uh, levels. I like to highlight, uh, in both cases, the best is to find the soft palate with the eula first, uh, for the better orientation, and then uh, you can realize where you are, uh, you can uh, recognize the epipharynx, the nasopharynx it means above, the mesopharynx or oropharynx below with the root of the tongue, and the larmous part will uh, show the uh, laryngeal inlet. And this is the laryngopharynx at the same time. First I'd like to uh, tell you the uh, skeleton of the larynx. Here you see on the neck a schematic drawing with these elements. I like to highlight something. We have a, a arch like a bone on the top. This is, not, this is not part of the larynx, the hyoid bone. And below, in light blue, you see the laryngeal cartilages, uh, the major cartilages at, at least, uh, the thyroid cartilage, uh, the uh, cricoid cartilage. On the top of the cricoid, this is a posterior view, uh, the arytenoid cartilages. And at the end, we have the epiglottis. Uh, you studied this in the previous semester in histology, that this is uh, with uh, elastic cartilage. The others uh, have uh, hyaline cartilage. Uh, to describe the details, i like to start the uh, uh, thyroid cartilage first. It has two laminae, which unite in the midline in the laryngeal prominence. It is also called Adam's apple. It's a good landmark for orientation. And uh, then there is a little oblique elevation called oblique line. In front and behind, we have uh, muscle insertions. And at the end, we have uh, two pairs of uh, processes, superior and inferior horns. On the inferior horn, medially, we have a little uh, article surface for the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage is next. It has a lamina from behind. And in front, we have an arch and it has four uh, articular surfaces. Two are on the top, here you see them, for the arytenoid cartilages, and two are on the lateral side for the previously mentioned thyroid cartilages. The arytenoid cartilage is next. This is a triangle shape cartilage having a tip or apex on the top and the larger uh, part called the base at the bottom. It has two uh, processes. One is the vocal process, this is where the vocal ligament or vocal fold, the true vocal fold is attached. And uh, the posterior uh, process is called muscular process. This is for muscle insertion. And this is how the muscles are able to act on the arytenoid cartilage. At the end, we have the uh, epiglottis having a lamina on the top and the stalk or petiolus uh, below. And uh, as I told you again, this is elastic in contrast to the others, which are hyaline cartilages. I'd like to uh, describe some uh, membranes and ligaments uh, on the outer surface and also on the inner. Uh, next uh, slide. And first, the external ligaments and uh, membranes are seen. On the top between the hyoid bone and the 
uh, thyroid cartilage, we have the thyroid membrane having a little foramen on it on each side for the superlangeal structures such as the superlangeal nerve, uh, superlangeal artery and vein. And uh, we have a, a reinforcement in the midline as median thyrohyoid ligament, and we have also laterally uh, a little ligament, uh, including a little cartilage, the cartilago triticia. Uh, these are not important. But more important uh, is the lower part uh, regarding the uh, membranes and ligaments. Between the uh, thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage arch, in the midline, we have the median thyro a cricothyroid ligament or ligamentum conicum in the clinical practice. The latter part is called lateral cricothyroid ligament. This is where we perform the conicotomy if we have an occlusion in the uh, airways and we will see later that it is uh, already under the true vocal fold where the airways are again wider. So we are able to provide free airways with this incision if necessary. Uh, this is a posterior view, you see the same elements. Uh, we have inner elastic uh, membranes. We have a quadrangular membrane in the upper part and triangular membrane or conus elasticus in the lower part. As you see, uh, the upper one, the quadrangular membrane has an upper margin. This will be included in the laryngeal inlet in the areopiglottic fold we study later. And the lower margin is, is called vestibular ligament. The posterior part is attached to the aritended cartilage the anterior part to the epiglottis. This corresponds otherwise to the uh, vestibule of the larynx we will see on the next slide. The uh, lar uh, internal elastic membrane is called triangular membrane or just simply conus elasticus. Uh, Cricovocal uh, membrane is another term for this in the different anatomical book, books. Uh, the upper margin is the famous uh, uh, vocal ligament. This is found in the true vocal fold. And the anterior margin is in the midline where we have the ligamentum conicum or median uh, cricothyroid ligament. The lower margin is attached to the uh, cricoid cartilage. So these are elastic uh, membranes. If we watch this from above, we see the shape of the gap between the two true vocal folds. The two uh, vo uh, true vocal folds are these, the little uh, elongated triangle. And, uh, uh, the gap between them is called rima glottidis, or just simply glottis. And it has two parts, I like to highlight it already on this figure. The anterior part between the two true vocal ligaments, this elongated triangle, is the intermembranous part. But it extends backward and uh, it is found in a little rectangle between the two aritonoid cartilages. This is the intercartilaginous part. We use different muscles for the adduction of these two parts of the rima glottidis. That's why I wanted to highlight it. This is the laryngeal cavity. It's a distinct question on the exam. Uh, the laryngeal inlet is seen here partly with the epiglottis. This is frontal cut. This is a, a median sagittal section or mid sagittal section. And the upper part of the cavity is called vestibule, laryngeal vestibule. If you remember, we studied vestibule also in the nasal cavity and the oral cavity. So the first part of the cavities are called usually uh, vestibule. And the larmous part, where we have again wider part, is the subglottic uh, cavity. Uh, we see on each side two uh, folds. The upper is the false vocal fold or vestibular fold, also called ventricular fold. And the lower, more protruding part, as you see here, is the true vocal fold, or just vocal fold. Uh, the little gap which extends laterally and then upward is the so-called ventricle, laryngeal ventricle. So that's why this upper fold can be called vestibular fold or ventricular fold, because this is which separates the vestibule from the ventricle. And as you see here, uh, the uh, so-called conicotomy, the site of the conicotomy on this drawing, this is the ligamentum conicum or median uh, cricothyroid ligament. This is where we have to perform the conicotomy if necessary. This is already in the subglottic cavity, so somewhere here, where we don't have any narrow point of the airways. So that's why if we cut here, we are able to provide free airways downward. 
two joints, two pairs of uh, joints are found in the larynx. First is around the transverse axis, labeled with red. This is called cricothyroid joint. You see this in different aspects. And the blue is a nearly vertical axis, or around nearly vertical axis. This is the cricoarytenoid joint. Uh, we have to understand the movement of the cartilages around this. For example, in case of the cricothyroid joint, which is around the transverse axis, uh, the muscle is able to move the uh, arch of the cricoid cartilage anteriorly upward, uh, resulting in the uh, rotation of the lamina of the cricoid cartilage downward carrying the arytenoid cartilage at the top because these are coupled by this joint. And that's why the two uh, points, the two end points of the two vocal uh, ligament or uh, vocal fold will be elongated and that's why we are able to stretch the vocal fold. As you see, the two end points of the uh, vocal ligament, true vocal ligament or vocal fold, will be between the inner surface of the lamina of the thyroid cartilage and the uh, vocal process of the arytenoid cartilage. I mentioned sometimes vocal fold, vocal ligament. Vocal ligaments or ligament is included in the vocal fold, so both are correct, basically. <clears throat> now let's see the muscles. The muscles, all of them are otherwise skeletal muscle in the larynx. Don't forget it on the uh, histo part of the exam. Uh, can be divided into two groups the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles. Only one pair of the uh, skeletal muscles are uh, related to the extrinsic muscle of the larynx, the cricothyroid, as you see here, in front or lateral aspect of it. Uh, it has two parts. One is attached in front of the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage. The other is behind. According to this, we have straight and oblique part. If they contract, this is which results the previously mentioned movement around the transverse axis between the thyroid and the cricoid cartilages. So anteriorly, uh, as you see here, this muscle when it contracts, it's able to elevate the arch of the uh, cricoid relatively. And it means we have a rotation of the lamina of the uh, cricoid downward carrying the arytenoid cartilage. And that's why the two end points of the two vocal ligament will be elongated, it means stretch or tension of the vocal fold, and this is how we are able to increase the uh, uh, pitch, so higher frequency generated. In the next uh, few slides, we see the other muscle group, uh, the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, but first I'd like to tell you functionally the antagonist of the previous, which is the thyroarytenoid. Thyroarytenoid is seen here, this is located in my drawing, would be lateral to the red arrows, thyroarytenoid. So basically, it bridges the same distance as the true vocal ligament is. So uh, inner surface of the uh, lamina of the thyroid and the arytenoid cartilage. That's why I got the name, thyroarytenoid. So when this muscle contracts, as the red arrow shows, uh, the two endpoints of the vocal ligament to true vocal ligament will be closer. So that's why uh, it is able to relax the uh, vocal fold. So uh, we are able to lower the pitches. We are able to generate deeper frequencies. This is what it shows. Uh, we teach the innermost part of the thyroid as a different muscle, vocalis, not seen in the figure. It would be uh, somewhere here, but it's quite tricky muscle because the the posterior part is attached to the arytenoid cartilage, but anteriorly it is attached into the uh, vocal ligament itself, so it doesn't bridge the whole distance. That's why we are able to fine-tune this tension of the uh, vocal ligament in different parts. So, for example, if I take one part like this to the end of the uh, arrowhead of the uh, posterior uh, arrow, then uh, this part of the uh, the vocal ligament will be relaxed if this muscle contracts, but the rest of the ligament will be stretched. So we are able to fine tune, as I told you, the tension of the vocal ligament with this muscle. Uh, the next functional group uh, includes three muscles which are able to regulate the size 
of the uh, and, and the shape this way, the rima glottidis. First, I like to describe the posterior cricoarytenoid, which originates from the posterior surface of the lamina. This is a posterior aspect, and obliquely uh, ascends to the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage. Here you don't see the arytenoid cartilage, only the tip, because it is uh, covered by muscles. So this is where we have somewhere the uh, muscular process of the other cartilage. If this muscle contracts, theoretically we have a pulling direction like this, downward and backward, but because between these two uh, cartilages we have a nearly vertical axis, only the medial uh, rotation is, uh, is done. So this way, as the light blue arrow shows, and around the vertical axis, labeled with a violet ring, uh, the anterior part of the cartilage rotates laterally. So this is what the yellow uh, arrow shows. So this is how we are able to abduct the rimoglottidis, I mean, enlarge the uh, rimoglottidis, how we are able to abduct the true vocal folds. Uh, at the same time, if you compare with the uh, uh, resting phase, the uh, two endpoints of the true vocal ligament will be a bit elongated. So this muscle results also the tension of the vocal fold and vocal ligament. So this is the posterior cricoarytenoid. This is seen on, uh, on a lateral aspect uh, also. And its antagonist is the lateral cricoarytenoid, this one from a lateral aspect. This comes from the cricoid cartilage and attaches to the same point, to the muscular process of the arytenoid cartilage. This theoretically would move downward and forward the muscular process, but again, because of the uh, vertical axis between the two joints, between the two cartilages, uh, it's able to pull the muscular process only forward. Light blue arrow shows this, and the result is the uh, medial rotation of the vocal processes. This is how we are able to close the rimoglottidis anteriorly, called adduction of the, uh, 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 of the uh, vocal ligaments. So two muscles are able to regulate the shape and the size of the rimoglottidis this way. Uh, this one will relax a bit the vocal ligament because the distance between the two endpoints is a bit decreased. Uh, as you see here, uh, this muscle closes only the anterior part of the rimoglottidis, and that's why I highlighted this. This is the so-called intermembranous part, but the posterior part is still, um, is, uh, still open. That's why we need other, other muscle for closure of this part. And that's why I have to go back to the previous slide where I show this. We have the arytenoidus uh, muscle having two parts, the transverse, deeply located, and the oblique, this X shape, and especially the transverse is able to slide the two arytenoid cartilages closer to each other, and that's why the posterior uh, found uh, gap is closed. So this is important also for the uh, vocalization, and uh, this is able to close the so-called intercartilages part of the rima glottidis. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the uh, shape of the rima glottidis in quiet inspiration. So the anterior part, the intermembranous part, is an elongated triangle. The posterior part, the intercartilaginous part, is rather a rectangle. If we have forced inspiration, the anterior part is a larger triangle, but the posterior part becomes also a triangle. And as you see, uh, the distance, which was in resting phase only somewhere here, uh, is elongated. So that's why this uh, rotation is able to stretch the vocal fold at the same time. Uh, we have an increase approximately uh, with 30% uh, in this case in length. That's why we have a stretch. In case of the lateral cricoarytenoid, crico we have this movement. So this is the resting, the continuous line, and this interrupted line will be the result of the action of the lateral cricoarytenoid, uh, closure of the anterior part of the rimoglottidis. But as you see, 
the posterior part is still uh, uh, open. This is what we use for whispering. For vocalization, we have to close the posterior part as well. That's why we have to contract simultaneously the bilateral lateral cricoarytenoid and also the transverse and oblique arytenoid. Uh, in this case, as you see the length from the resting phase, co uh, continuous line, to be interrupted line, it's uh, more medial and a little bit shorter than the original position. That's why this movement is able to relax the uh, vocal ligament a bit. This is what you see with laryngoscopy, the quiet inspiration anteriorly. We have an elongated triangle. Posterior, we have rather a rectangle. If we have a forced inspiration, both become uh, triangles, larger in front, and posterior becomes a triangle as well. And in case of whispering, the anterior part is already uh, closed, but posterior is we have still open part. The inter uh, cartilages part is still open. For uh, vocalization, we have to close both parts. Before I describe the vocalization, I like to tell something about the histology of the uh, vocal ligament, the true vocal ligament. It's quite special. We will study in histo uh, histology that even the epithelial lining is different from the rest of the airways because it should be resistant to the mechanic stress, uh, the uh, pressure uh, passing through the uh, gap, and uh, that's why it has a stratified non keratinous squamous epithelium. It's another story. I will describe it in my histo lecture. But the mucous membrane, as I described earlier, has two parts, the epithelium, and we have the lamina propria, the underlying connective tissue, which has, interestingly, three different layers. The superficial layer is rather a gel-like layer, which is ideal for st uh, string, like tension and pliability. And the middle and the deep layer uh, contain uh, fibers, collagen and especially elastic fibers. But they develop only around the age of uh, three or four. So it's very important to use the larynx, so force the kids basically for crying. So what our grandma said originally that let the baby cry to uh, force to develop the, the lung, it's true basically, at least at the level of the uh, larynx, but the same is in the uh, lung, probably. Uh, if somebody got, uh, you know, stroke and doesn't use uh, the larynx because of the paralysis of the muscles, uh, with time, these uh, uh, elastic and collagen uh, fiber elements uh, disappear gradually. And even if somebody was recovered, at least in the brain, was not able to use the larynx because these elements were missing. So uh, the collagen and the elastic elements in this region are very important <clears throat> for the proper string-like uh, functions. And the deepest part uh, shows a skeletal muscle. Uh, in our case, we call this uh, vocalis. This textbook uses just the tyroarytenoid name for this. This is part of the tyroarytenoid, it's true. But as I told you earlier, it's a bit different from the tyroarytenoid because the two endpoints a little bit different. Uh, next is about the vocalization itself. We have to increase the subglottic pressure. It means we have to have an inspiration first, then we have to close the two parts of the rima glottidis with those uh, muscles what I mentioned. So anteriorly the lateral cricoarytenoid, posteriorly the transverse arytenoid. That's why if somebody has a quite uh, common uh, usage of these muscles in case of uh, classes, even 10,000 times is uh, contracted. And uh, we have a fundamental frequency or pitch when we press out from below uh, the air, creating vibration of the vocal cords, uh, having longitudinal and transverse waves. But this is not the final form, because the final form of the voice will be created in the upper part of the airways, where we have other elements, uh, pharynx, soft palate, the tongue, the cheeks, the lips, teeth, nasal cavity. Everybody knows if somebody has a missing tooth or inflammation in the paranasal cavities, immediately the sound uh, will differ. Uh, we have some uh, factors which uh, modify uh, this uh, basal uh, pitch or frequency. 
uh, for example, the ages and the sex. In, in female and children, uh, higher frequencies are generated. The length will different or will, will change with time, you know, in boys, could bricks, and can uh, thicken in case of inflammations uh, because of the swollen mucous membrane can be a sign of allergy as well. So this is a quite uh, risky uh, you know, situation and it uh, results in a hoarse voice. And in some cases, uh, even if it's uncontrolled, we increase the uh, pitch for uh, you know, crying for help uh, with the activation of skeletal muscles. Uh, otherwise, everybody has an individual uh, frequency spectrum, so that's why it can be used for personal identification even. The third group of the intrinsic muscles functionally are able to regulate the size uh, of the laryngeal inlet. This muscle, which is partly the previously mentioned arytenoid, the oblique part, which continues then upward as the epiglottic, this is able to uh, constrict the laryngeal inlet as you see the uh, blue arrows. Its antagonist is another muscle, its upper part of the thyroarytenoid. This is the thyroarytenoid, what we mentioned already, for relaxing the vocal ligament. And upper part is called thyroepiglottic. Uh, this is the antagonist of the previous, so it's able to widen the uh, laryngeal inlet. At the same time, the vestibule, the uppermost part of the laryngeal cavity, is uh, getting an error. Next uh, is the blood supply and the innervation of the larynx. Uh, usually it's dual, so we have two uh, nerves, two arteries at least. If we regard the innervation, uh, both the superior and the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is called at the end inferior laryngeal nerve, are branches of the vagus nerve, number 10, if you remember, uh, among the cranial nerves. But the uh, superior laryngeal nerve innervates only the extrinsic muscle with its uh, external branch. The internal branch passes through the little hole on the thyroid membrane, what I mentioned, and it's able to innervate the mucous membrane of the larynx above the vocal fold. The rest of the muscles, so it means the intrinsic muscle of the larynx, are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and this way the mucous membrane under the vocal ligament also innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The blood supply is dual. One is the superior laryngeal artery, which comes from the superior thyroid. This is a branch of the external carotid. And the inferior laryngeal is from the inferior thyroid, which is from the thyrocervical trunk. And this is a branch of the subclavian artery. You will study these uh, branches and we will dissect them uh, in the uh, third semester, so we don't see them now. The venous drainage is different. We have the corresponding superior and uh, lower, but in this case it's called middle thyroid vein. And we have an inferior thyroid vein which collects the uh, thyroid venous plexus. So the laryngeal uh, blood supply, laryngeal, laryngeal uh, venous drainage is also related to these veins. But I like to highlight this part, the inferior uh, thyroid vein and the related uh, thyroid venous plexus. That's why you must not cut the airways uh, under the larynx because you may hurt the uh, veins in front. And uh, in these veins, we have negative pressure. So when we cut them, we may cause air embolus, which is even more risky uh, than the original problem. So that's why we have to perform the conicotomy at the level of this. Uh, so uh, between the thyroid and cricoid cartilages, here we don't have significant venous plexus. The uh, last part shows the uh, lymphatic drainage of the larynx. Uh, which is also dual. Uh, the upper part above the vocal folds uh, are collected to the uh, superficial group of the deep cervical lymph nodes and under the uh, uh, rimoglottidis or the uh, two vocal folds uh, we have other uh, option. First we have pre and para tra uh, tra tracheal lymph nodes or pre and paralaryngeal lymph nodes and then to the inferior group of the deep cervical lymph nodes. At the end, as we studied from on the head, everything is filtered through the deep cervical lymph nodes along the internal jugular vein, and at the end we have a final drainage, the so-called jugular trunk, and at the end we see 
uh, in the uh, medias genome how they continue on the right and left side differently. Thank you very much for your attention.